Well, let's open our Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 3. We're moving along, aren't we? We're moving along, aren't we, in Matthew's gospel. <laughs> I was trying to figure out Koinonia last night, and uh, uh, for some reason, uh, one of the scriptures came up. We were, you know, just in our discussion, things we were sharing. I think it was about Matthew, you know, maybe chapter uh, 13 or so, and I was just trying to think in my mind, you know, when we would be at Matthew chapter 3. I figured it would probably be next spring sometime, maybe, you know, but uh, uh, six months before the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to announce to her that she was the chosen one of God to be the mother of of our Lord Jesus Christ, he appeared to Zechariah to let him know that his wife Elizabeth would also bear a son, and his name would be John. Luke goes on to tell us in his gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 through 17, that in speaking to Zechariah, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of uh, the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel, we move ahead now about 28 to 30 years from where we left off last time in chapter 2, the events of chapter 2. And this morning we pick up the ministry of John. Um, each of the Gospel writers have something to say about this servant of the Lord. And why not? When Jesus himself said of John, assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. So there's, uh, there's quite an endorsement. And so each one of the gospel writers have something to say about this most unique man, not only of the Bible, but of history, of the kingship of Jesus Christ. And you remember that we have shared with you that Matthew's gospel is really about the king, showing that Jesus Christ is the promised king, the promised Messiah, that he, his genealogy in chapter 1, we saw that he came through the line of, of Abraham through through David. He is a son of Abraham and he is the son of David, which showed that he was the royal line entitled uh, to be king. In chapter 2, uh, his kingship was shown by the circumstances that surrounded his birth. Uh, the Magi that came and, and honored him at his birth, but then also Herod who hated him because uh, the Magi had come to to find him who was to be king of the Jews. And of course, this was something that Herod felt that in his heart that he was the king of the Jews. And so he sought to kill him so that no one would, came, would come along, you know, to take his place. Uh, in chapter 2 also, we saw the four prophecies fulfilled by Jesus Christ. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, his birth. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. And Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. All of these prophecies really uh, just testifying of the kingship of Jesus Christ. As we move on though in time now, we see... Uh, him being publicly recognized uh, through the ministry of his cousin, John the Baptist, who was the forerunner sent ahead to prepare the way of the Lord. And we begin reading in Matthew chapter 3 this morning, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair, 
with Judea and all of the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 7, And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said of them, Brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, we're really not going to go that far. We are going to comment a little bit on verse 7 today. I, last week, we took all 23 verses, and I felt like it was on overload. And so, I'm going to back off. We'll see where the balance is this week with uh, maybe these um, six verses, just using uh, verse 7 as a, as a transition verse for us for next week. But this morning's message is repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Father, we ask that you would teach us this morning, Lord. We know that you, Lord, are the teacher, the Holy Spirit, Lord, moving upon our hearts, taking your word, Lord, illuminating your word and impacting our lives, Lord, with your word, that we might grow and that we might grow up in Christ. Father, we just pray that as we come today to gather around the table, Lord, that you have prepared for us, that we would feed Feed heartily, Lord, upon, upon the meal that you have prepared for us, Lord, and that each one of us, Lord, would go away full, Lord, to overflowing because, Lord, you have met us where we are with your provision. So we bless you this morning, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Challenge us, Lord. Uh, encourage us and build us up today, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if we didn't have the other writers, if I hadn't read to you this morning from Luke's gospel, we might say, well, who's this guy? You know, where did he come from? He just hops off of the pages here in, in Matthew's gospel. All of a sudden, you know, we've, we're, we've, we've got the genealogy of Jesus and we have circumstances, you know, surrounding the early, very early part of his life. And then all of a sudden we move ahead 28 to 30 years. And here's this other guy, John the Baptist. Who is this guy? You know, Matthew just brings him on the scene. And so it's important. And I really encourage you to read the other gospels. As we go through Matthew's gospel, hello, and put them sort of in the same order. John's gospel is a little bit different, but each one of the gospel writers talk about John the Baptist and give us some insight into this very, very important uh, man of history and, and of the Bible. And so I encourage you to read uh, what the other gospel writers have to say about uh, John, but also as we move through the Gospel of Matthew, that you would uh, just read the other Gospels. You'll benefit greatly as each one of them, as we have pointed out, take a little different view and a little different approach, although their emphasis is to glorify and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. John means Jehovah is gracious. And his whole ministry is reflected in his name to proclaim the grace of the Lord. Jehovah is gracious. John's message was the grace of God revealed in the Son of God. That his provision and his provision for the way of salvation. It says that John came in those days. And the word actually came means that his coming was with an official arrival. Uh, it signaled, if you will, the beginning, really, of the public ministry of our Lord. Uh, so as he came, it was with an official arrival. It, it wasn't, as it might appear here, just out of nowhere. He was being prepared in the wilderness for the ministry that the Lord had prepared for. You, re, you remember the Bible tells us that he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from the time of his mother's womb. To men, it may have seemed that his ministry was out of nowhere, but certainly it was in the plan of God. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, I just happened to be in the neighborhood, guys, so I thought I'd just preach and, and, and proclaim the coming of our Lord. No, it was in the plan of God. He was called and he was sent for this moment in time to prepare the way of the Lord. You know, really... Your life and that same calling, you know, when, when maybe we didn't know it before we came to the Lord, but after we came to Him, we now begin to realize that we are special, we are unique, you are uniquely created in the image and likeness of God with a special ministry, and He has a special plan for each one of you. 
even as he had that special plan for John the Baptist. And so it's important for us to really seek the Lord, that we know that we're willing to take those steps of faith as God moves upon our life and moves upon us, that we are able to see and to realize uh, the plan that God has for us. You know, we just can't sit back. We have to seek the Lord and then move with His guidance as He begins to show us and reveal to us, you know, that specific plan that He has for us. It may have been even as Esther. You remember Esther? There's always one little phrase in the book of Esther that just steps out for me as uh, Mordecai, her, uh, her uncle... Uh, you remember Haman had this plan, you know, to get rid of this guy, you know, because he won't bow down to me, you know, he won't show me the honor that's due me. And he had his whole ego set up, you know, on things that were going on now. And Esther was married to the king and she hadn't seen him in a, in a, a long time because no one went before the king unless they were called before the king. And you remember Mordecai, Mordecai was encouraging Esther, you better go talk to him or, you know, we're all going to be wiped out. You know, you're a Jew, I'm a Jew, we're all going to be wiped out, you know, because this is the whole thing, you know, to wipe out the people of God. And I remember that verse, I think it's in chapter 4 of Esther, you know, where Mordecai says, maybe it was just for this time in history that you were here to go before the king so that, you know, the people of God would indeed be spared. But, you know, here we are. You ever think about being born in 19, I mean, living here in 19, I don't know when you were born. I can't even remember when I was born, you know, it's been so long ago. But, uh, you know, living here in, in 1996, we live probably in one of the most exciting times of world history. I believe that it is indeed the time and, and, uh, uh, of, of our Lord's return. I really believe that. I believe in the imminent return of our Lord in, at any moment, but I believe that we are indeed the generation in the last days. And it's one of the most exciting times to be alive, to proclaim the glory and the coming of our Lord. I can't think of a more exciting time uh, to be alive than actually right now. Uh, you know, you might think about being alive at the time that our Lord walked upon the earth, and that would have been a very powerful and, a, and, a, and a, just a, oh, an awesome time. But I think right now when He is coming again, you know, and to be able to have that message, that, that urgent message today, you know, to just be able to share the grace and the love of the Lord and to be able to fill the, the ministry, you know, that He has given to us. It's, it's just, ah, oh, it's exciting. And so... I just pray that you would be excited about God's calling upon your life. You know, that for this time, He chose us to be alive at this very particular time in history. And it wasn't just so, you know, we could come to church once a week, come to a chilly thing, you know, in two weeks and do this and, you know. But it's to really, you know, just live our life to the glory of God day by day, sharing His love and His grace and His mercy, His salvation and His forgiveness. John was preaching in the wilderness. The word for preaching is the word that means to herald. He was proclaiming something. Um, a herald's job, if you will, was to go before the king and to make sure that there was nothing in the way to hinder his arrival. Uh, he, was, he was to go and to make sure that the roads were all smooth so that when he was riding in his cart, you know, he wouldn't go over some of the bumpy roads, you know, that, that it was just, re you know, just fresh pavement laid, you know. Uh, get out there and clean the road and, and just, but, but so there were no obstacles. Make sure that there was no one in the way, you know, that was there to stop the king. But make sure that, that uh, everybody was alerted to, they knew that he was c coming and that his way was prepared. Um, and everything was taken care of. Uh, I'm not sure that John's ministry as a herald was exactly what everyone was expecting, though. Uh, this man, being one of the most unique uh, people of the Bible and of history, uh, it wasn't, um, I don't know, he just wasn't probably what uh, the Jews might have been waiting for, looking for, expecting to herald the coming king, the Messiah. Um, he was on a mission. He was a loner, though. His preparation was out in the wilderness. But he was a loner. You know, he wasn't a guy that was all wrapped up with what people think of me, 
what they, uh, you know, might, you know, think of the way I look, the way I dress, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, you know, he, he, he was unique, if nothing else, just to look at. Um, but he wasn't out uh, to, to really impress men. He was on a mission, a mission that God had placed upon his heart, and he had a message. It's interesting where his message was proclaimed. Where did he proclaim the message? He didn't go to Jerusalem in the city, but he was out in the wilderness. He was down by the Jordan River. And I think that this is significant where he proclaimed his message. Because if people were going to hear the message, they were going to have to get away from the distractions of the city. They were going to have to get away where only that message could be heard. Where there weren't a lot of distractions. And I think this is God's grace again. You know, just moving people. Uh, it goes to show you, you know, it doesn't matter if you're kind of located up on here on the hill, far away from any place. I mean, God can get the people to you as he moves upon the hearts and the lives of the people. And here John was proclaiming, he was heralding the message that the king was coming. Israel was going through a very dry time. They were really in, in a desert period of their life, if you will. You remember it's been 400 years since God has spoken to the nation Israel through a prophet. When, Ma uh, when Malachi's prophecy closed, it was four, the period of 400 years that God really spoke to the people of Israel. And so you see the first prophet then arrives on the scene is this guy John. You know, and, and you remember what's all happened in, in, in Jerusalem and in Israel now. I mean, we have the Pharisees that we'll talk about in a minute. These religious leaders and the Sadducees and the Herodians and, and, you know, all of these people that look like, you know, quote unquote, religious people. And then here's John. I have a message. Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And this is the message that God had him proclaim with power. But it had been 400 years since God had spoken through a prophet to the people of God. And now he would speak to the hearts of the people through this man. His message, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. With all due respect, the religion of the Jews had become dead. Ritualistic. And it was now time for a change. And the challenge to change was the message of John. It was simple. It was direct. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. A hardened, cold, ritualistic, legalistic religion was never what God intended for His people. His desire was communion. His, commu his desire was fellowship. His desire was one of love and trust and obedience. It was one of really a personal relationship with the living God. Our God is alive. He's not dead. He is alive. He is living. And He wants to have that intimate and communion and fellowship with His creation. The message of John is the message of our Lord. And was the message of his disciples, both then and now. And it hasn't changed. Our relationship must be maintained. It must be kept alive. And quite frankly, I believe that this message is primarily for God's people. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I believe that the message of repentance is mainly for God's people. Now, without getting into the semantics of it and spending time arguing, and I'm sure that we could do that if we, you know, uh, wanted to, and, and we don't want to, do we? <laughs> we don't want to do that. We know that the prophetic ministry today, according to Paul, Chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, verse 3, is for edification, for exhortation, 
and for the comfort of men. That in and of itself, though, suggests to me the people of God, because those outside of a relationship with God really are not going to be edified by what the Word has to say. Did you ever try to counsel a non-believer, an unbeliever, by the Word of God? Yeah, but I don't believe the Word of God. So right there, you know, it's like, stop. We know that those certain prophets of old were sent to foreign countries. Jonah was sent to Nineveh to warn of God's judgment. Most often, the message of the prophet was that of warning God's people. Theologically, the word means to change one's mind. You might say, well, isn't that really what the unsaved is supposed to do. Yes, but first, the bottom line is to believe upon the name of the Son of God. It's to believe and to receive the message because before belief in the message, before belief in the one whom the message proclaims is really embraced, Before there is, or before there can be repentance, really, there must be a belief. And so to the unbeliever, primarily, it's believe in the name of the Son of God, and then you can count on repentance following. Because the unbeliever will then realize, you know, their unworthiness, because they will then see the living God, they will see Christ for the first time in in His glory. And they'll realize just how far it is that we really uh, match up. How far, uh, you know, I mean, we can't even match up. But once they believe, there's no doubt that there will be repenting. But I believe that repenting follows believing. Wherever it comes in your mind, theologically, you know, it means the same thing. It means to turn around. It means to change direction. It means to change the mind and the will. It doesn't mean do a 360, as we were talking this morning uh, in, our, in our class this morning. It means to do a 180. It means you're going this way, and now you're going this way. It means turning from sin to God. It means turning from sin to righteousness. And so there's a, there's a direct turning from to God. It's more than feeling sorry for or regretting uh, something. Uh, We all may feel sorry about things in our lives. Some may even feel sorry or regret that they ever got caught for some of the things that they've done. But how many of even believers, how many believers are hiding things in their life? Now, they're not hiding them from God because we know that all things are naked and open before the one with whom we have to do. But how many things are being excused in our lives? How many things would be being... um, I can't think of another word except excused. When God would call it sin in our lives, maybe it's an attitude that we just kind of nurse. That we make excuses for. That's just the kind of guy that I am. And so they're just going to have to accept it. But God wants to conform us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Maybe it's things that we do. You know, maybe some have a little habit of sneaking off, you know, and grabbing a little magazine and taking a look at it every once in a while. You know, I do not know how some magazines end up coming to my house, but I want to tell you what. I'm glad I get the mail before anybody else does because I want to hit the I want to hit the circular file with some of these things that come in before they ever even get a chance. You know, I mean, things that, you know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. But the newspapers are the same way. Some of the things, but how many, you know, maybe you're harboring little things in their life. You know, that God is calling sin, and we're trying to excuse. Repent, He says. See, believer, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Would we keep doing some of these things if we never got caught? Is it the regretting or feeling sorry that we got caught? You remember what somebody once said, you know, um, I got to think of this. Um, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord or he'll do it in front of your friends. (laughs) See, I'd rather do it in front of the Lord. 
confess my sin because he knows all about it anyway, doesn't he? But then turn from it. Don't make excuses for it. Don't let it linger on in my life. Don't nurse it along. Don't compare it with maybe something that you have seen in somebody else's life. Well, mine's not others. Doesn't matter. Sin is sin is sin. God doesn't have first degree sin, second degree sin, third degree sins, you know. Sin is sin. It's all on the same scale. And we need to deal with it in our lives. Paul writes and tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. As God begins to work in our life, the godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation not to be regretted of. I begin to see in my life those things that are displeasing to Him. I clearly see those things that are a violation of God's love and His grace and His holy standard that I have maybe allowed to to go on. And I see them, and they bring a sorrow to my heart. They bring a sorrow that I would excuse them. God doesn't excuse sin, does He? He judges sin. And so, as I see those things, there is a repentance that I want to turn from them. I can't do that on my own. I don't know about you. I might try to want to turn from habits that have like been you know, gnawing at me for a long time. I might want to, oh, God, I hate this, you know, and I, you know, I'm, today, I'll never do that again. I can't, you know, I end up doing it again, you know. But the power of God yielding to Him, surrendering to Him, He can make the change and will make the change if I have a heart that really wants to be molded, wants to be shaped, wants to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And the more I see Him, and the more I see the beauty of the Lord in His holiness, the more I see the grace of God as He so tenderly works in my life, then I want to yield to Him more and more in my life. I want to do those things that please the Lord. I don't want to do those things that offend Him. I don't want to think those thoughts. I don't want to treat my brothers and sisters with a selfish attitude. I I, I want to give. I want to share. I want to love. And I want to build you up. And we got to. We want to do that together. If I harbor things in my heart, in my life, if I don't see the Lord, then I'm not going to have a godly sorrow over those attitudes. I may weep as Esau wept, but there was nothing really that affected or changed my heart. That godly sorrow or those tears of repentance. It says, Lord, take me, mold me, shape me, break me, conform me into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Because we realize what took place at Calvary's cross. We realize the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Not as we read even this morning in Psalm 32, the the covering over of our transgression. But Jesus came to take away our sin. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the confession is the repenting and turning, turning from it. You know, many times one may not even know what is wrong. And what is right. What it means to be poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To see the condition in the world. To mourn and weep over the condition. Blessed are those who mourn. Because they see the condition in the world. And even in their own lives. It's not always a finger pointing, is it? Because the three are pointed back at me. It was God dealing personally with us. But as we were even talking this morning in our, in our class to, to minister to the, to the new believer, many times a, a, a new believer, you, they don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. Yes, they have been just, but now there's that working, that ongoing work of God whereby they are also being sanctified. Each one of us being sanctified. Another aspect of salvation. 
But repentance is a call for change from the inside out. Anything else is superficial, and God will not be mocked. You know, as one has said, you can take a pig, you know, and you can bring that pig into your house. You can clean him up, wash him up, keep him as a pet. But if you leave the back door open, he's going to be out the door looking for the first mud puddle he can hop into. And you know, really, even as believers, we're kind of like that many times. If our eyes are not on the Lord, if we're not watching where we're going, if we're not keeping, you know, our eye on the Lord. God's interested in a change that makes a complete turnaround, a transformation that affects the mind and the will and the emotions. It's not simply going through the emotions, but it's a change from the inside out. John was preaching this message. Repent. There must be a change. A change within. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so I think John's message was also as Jesus legalistic religion and it can happen so easily even today among God's people and the message remains the same repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand the king is coming John says his kingdom is going to be established what about this phrase the kingdom of heaven is at hand Matthew is the only one who uses this phrase 39 times he uses this particular phrase. The other gospel writers use the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew may have used this term more frequently because he also uses, as we hear Jesus quote in different places in, in, uh, in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of God. Uh, but he, Matthew may have used this phrase because of the fact that he was writing specifically to the Jew. And you remember the Jew had a problem with saying the name God. And so they would have got the picture, if you will, by inner heaven for God. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Is there a difference, though, between the two? Um, there are some that say, yes, that there is a difference between the, the, the two phrases. And I'll just offer a few of these things who would like to make uh, the distinction. The kingdom of heaven is the earthly sphere of the universal kingdom of God. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is contained in, if you will, the kingdom of God. And the two will merge together when Christ... According to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28, and this is summed up, has put all of the enemies of God under his feet and delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. The kingdom of God includes only those who have come to God in faith. The church, the true church, the genuine believer, who have come to faith in Christ through, uh, uh, by being born again. It would include the Old Testament saints who also have come in faith as well as angels. The kingdom of heaven, however, includes not only those who are believers, but the kingdom of heaven also includes non-believers as we will see when we get to Matthew chapter 13, when the two are included there in uh, the kingdom of heaven. Um, in other words, uh, it will include also those who have made, it will include those who have made a true confession of faith, but who also who are simply mere professors uh, of faith. Uh, it'll be up to God to sort out and to distinguish though between the two. The kingdom of God, we're told, comes not with outward show. And I really believe that that is what John was getting to in his message that he was proclaiming here because there was a lot of outward show of pious religious arrogance. And uh, as Luke said in his uh, gospel, chapter 17, verse 20, uh, the kingdom of God comes not with outward show. It's clear, however, that when the king comes, his reign will be forever and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. This is what the Old Testament writers spoke about. His sovereign rule over both heaven and earth. In Psalm chapter 10, verse 16, the psalmist says, The Lord is king forever and ever. So his reign, his sovereign rule and his sovereign reign will be forever and ever. In Psalm 29, verse 10, and the Lord sits as king forever. 
In uh, Psalm 145, verse 13, and this is really um, uh, very similar to what we read in Daniel's prophecy, chapter 4, verse 3. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And so when the king comes, his reign will be forever and ever, will be an everlasting kingdom. The present reality of his kingdom is only as Jesus rules in our hearts and lives now, and reigns in the hearts and the lives of men. Uh, those to whom Christ is Lord and Savior, He is King. He is ruling. He is reigning. Presently, He does not exercise His full uh, rule, divine rule and will over the earth. It's voluntary, uh, voluntary. Uh, to those uh, who have received Christ. Certainly the kingdom of heaven uh, is at hand. Matthew tells us, now that this message and its messenger is the fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 3. For this is he, speaking of John, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so this prophecy is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 5. And it reads like this in the prophecy of Isaiah. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley for out so that they not reach. John put that which God says it's only religion is self-satisfying. And that's really what was taking place in Judaism. A hypocrisy, phoniness, trying to please God with an outward show. It can happen today. You know, how many people do we meet along the way that come on with this pious attitude? You know, you just look at them without knowing them and, yeah, boy, they're spiritual, I can tell. Just look at their belt buckle. Look at that bumper sticker on their car. Look at the size of that Bible they carry. But what about their walk? You know, a lot of people carry a big Bible. A lot of people have all the paraphernalia. And a lot of people go around pretending. Spirituality. They come right into your church. They come right in to this fellowship. Many times we get drawn up by them, looking at them. And they say many flowery things. And all of a sudden we become enamored with them. How spiritual they are. But then after a while, somehow, and I'll say it's by the grace of God, you begin to see the piousness and the attitude and the phoniness and the hypocrisy because you can't hide it forever, especially in a church this small. It reveals itself. No substance, only an outward show. A lying heart that for a while deceives the people of God, but never deceives God. But they deceive themselves too. That's what was happening as John was preaching his message, the message that was going out to the people of God about the hypocrisy, the phoniness, the outward show. And the sad thing is, is when it did affect the hearts of people who sincerely had a desire for God, but the only standard they had was these people of 
pious arrogance. And John says it's time to get right or get left. I, 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 like, I, I like that bumper sticker. Now, if I was to put one on, I like that bumper sticker. Get right or get left. Get real is what he's saying. Get real with God. Because God cuts right through all of the phoniness. And the only one who really in the end is going to be deceived is the one who is self-deceived. And so here comes this interesting character with a powerful message that he is proclaiming. And interestingly enough, I believe if the message is going to be received, it's going to be received here. It's not going to be received because, you know, someone was sent out by the religious organizations of the day and he looked the part. Because John, if anyone didn't look the part. John did not look the part of the religious people of his day. You know, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes when I'm called to, you know, go to a meeting, um, go visit someone uh, in the hospital, or, you know, you know, just when I have to be pastoral. <laughs> you know, I, I think about, oh... Should I put on something different today so that maybe, you know, I, when, I, when I go, I, yes, I'm the pastor of, I don't want to embarrass anybody, you know, if I got my jeans on and my tennis shoes. And, and, but, you know, I'm not going to go there to embarrass. I'm not going to go there to, to really belittle or undermine, you know, uh, God or, you know, my calling and all. But I have to go as I am. And quite frankly, even at 53... Almost, I think. How old? <laughs> Somewhere, I, t- I passed that one point like I forgot. But, you know, I still wear jeans and tennis shoes. I'm sorry. And I, that's my makeup for the day, usually. And if I'm downtown and I get caught and somebody calls and I got to go, I don't have a closet that has my pastoral costume hanging in the closet that I can quickly put on so I can go and look the part. You know, what you get or what you see is what you get. And that's it. Here I am. And thank you for accepting me just as I am too and praying for me for that also. But anyway, you know, John didn't look the part. And so if anyone was going to come and hear the message, it was going to be because the message was heard in the heart. It wasn't because he looked the part. Um, look at verse 4. He was clothed in camel's hair. He didn't have on the long flowing robes of the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He had on camel's hair, you know. Start to picture that. Hmm, hope it was dried and cured just right, you know. I don't know how they took care of that, but whoo. And, and then... Look what this guy fed up on. You want to go have lunch with, um, with John? He's eating locusts. Mmm, yum, mmm, good, <laughs> you know. Hey, I'd like to have you come over and have lunch with me. We're, what are you going to have today, John? Well, we'll have some wild honey and we'll have some locusts. Now, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, what that is, I, was it the little bug? I don't know. I tend to think it was the little bug, although the, uh, the pod from the carob tree um, Joshua's bread, I think it was called, also um, was called locusts. But I think that, you know, I don't know if he had any chocolate covering to put over the locusts to make it a little more uh, appetizing or whatever. But uh, nevertheless, you know, this is what, I mean, this is this guy. You can just imagine him, you know. I mean, probably he just didn't look the part. He didn't act the part, you know. And uh, here he was proclaiming the message. But notice all of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and all of Judea and all of the regions around Jordan went out to him. They heard the message and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, by submitting to his baptism, they were acknowledging what? That they were not fit for the kingdom of God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. They were not fit to be included in the kingdom of heaven. 
But here we see hearts that were being broken. We see lives that were being touched, lives that were being changed. And so there was a response to the message. Now, I want to say that this is significant because this is not the typical, when, you, when we read of John's baptism, it was not the typical ceremonial washing and cleansing of the religious leaders, you know, where uh, they would, uh, you know, if, if they touched anything unclean or before, you know, they, they have to put their hands up and let the water just drip, oh, and drip right off of their elbows, you know, into where, you know, ceremony and all, you know, this was not what was happening here. That's what is so interesting in, in the next verses about uh, the Pharisees and the religious leaders who are coming. But he's saying here that all Judea, Ju Jerusalem and Judea and all the region came about and were baptized by him in the Jordan confessing their sins. Here were Jews submitting to a baptism that typically was only given to Gentiles who wanted to actually convert and become a Jew. That's what basically, you know, that was the only baptism that the Jews, uh, you know, performed. And so it was, it was not something that they submitted to themselves, but that the Gentiles who were proselytes, who would be brought into Judaism, they were the ones that then submitted to this baptism. And of course, what were they doing? They were saying that they were on the outside and they wanted in. So what were these Jews now who were coming to be baptized, and maybe possibly some Gentiles too, but mainly those of the house of God or the household of God, the Jews, His chosen people were coming to be baptized. They were saying, hey, we're not fit. We're not fit for the kingdom of God. And so they submitted to John's baptism. They said they were on the outside and they needed to be brought into the kingdom. Realizing, and he'll get to this even next week, that it was not by the fact that they were Jews. It wasn't of racial descent. It wasn't because of nationality. But it was something in here, in the heart. And they realized that it was by repentance, a heart prepared to receive the king, that they might be received by him. Now, I want to make it clear here that this baptism in no way was complete in itself as far as salvation uh, was con was, is concerned, no more than, um, than it is today, than water baptism is, is today. The ritual of, of water baptism doesn't save a person. And it can be argued by the Church of Christ people as till they're blue in the face. It does not save. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Jot it down. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, there is also an antitype which now saves, namely baptism. Oh, and then you'll notice in parentheses when you read in your Bible, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, or in other words, not the washing, not the water, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. All, all of these, you know... There's nothing about water there. It's believe on the name of the Son of God. For by grace you have been saved. It's a work of God. Man believes. Man responds. It's the gift of God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, you will be saved. It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power of God. John's baptism basically looked forward to the King, to the Messiah, 
to the Savior in much the same way that Christian, quote-unquote, baptism looks back and identifies with. We identify with, they're looking forward to identifying with, we look back to identifying, to having identified with Christ as Lord and Savior and Messiah. But on our own merit, by our own works, we're not worthy of God. And that's why John is so direct with the message that he's preaching here. Um, you know, it's 11 o'clock. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it there. I was going to go on and share a little bit with you. But this is as good a place uh, as any to stop. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan. Uh, confessing. Uh, their sins. Um, John's message was direct. John's message was clear. For believers today, God speak to your heart. Are there things that you've been sitting on? Things you've been harboring? Things you've been excusing? Attitudes? Things that maybe he's been wanting to deal with in your heart? in your life for some time. But you've been excusing them. He's saying repent. Simple and clear. Repent. You proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You call yourself a Christian. We call, I'm not going to put you there and me here. We call ourselves Christians. Our lives are to glorify and exalt the living God who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if I allow things to continue in my life and just excuse them and excuse them and excuse them pretty soon, you know, I'm going to become anesthetized to them and think that they're okay when they're not, when God says they're not okay. And he'll catch up with us because he loves us and he'll discipline us and he'll correct us and he'll chasten us because God chastens those whom he loves. And he'll point those things out and he'll make those things very clear. But John makes it very clear in his first epistle. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if that's sincere in our heart, we're on our way. And he casts our sin as far as east is from the west and it's near us again. And we move on. And so for believers, repent. May God search your heart and my heart today. Things that we might be excusing and holding on to in our lives that he is saying, no, judge them. Paul said, examine your hearts to see if you're of the faith. I can't excuse things in my life and just go on pretending. God will take care of it. But we need to come to him now. If you're a non-believer who's here today, you know the message to you is believe upon the name of the Son of God because he loves you so much. How much is so much? For God so much loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Believe upon the name of the Son of God. What am I to believe? Believe the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is summed up in that verse right there, John 3, 16. It really tells us that man is a sinner separated from God. And the only way to heaven's glory, the only way is through faith in Jesus Christ and believing that that blood that was shed upon Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago was shed for you personally. If you're an unbeliever today, God's reaching out to you because he does love you. He took the risk to come. He counted the cost in coming for you and for me that we might have life. He laid his life down. God came from heaven's glory and laid his life down and was raised up on Calvary's cross to impart eternal life to those who would believe. Do you believe that message today? Do you believe that 2,000 years ago God came for you? If you were the only person on the face of the earth, He came for you. He would come for you. I love you that much. Believe on the name of the Son of God and you will be saved. Let's pray as we think about these things. Believers, 
and non-believers alike. Search us, God. Right where we're at, Lord, today, search our hearts, know us, God, and see if there is any evil, wicked way in us. Oh, Lord God, I ask you to forgive me, Lord, of my sin, to cleanse me, Lord, from all unrighteousness, even right now, Lord. Things, Lord, in my life, Lord, that I have excused, I ask God for forgiveness for those things right now, Lord. Lord, I want to glorify you. I want to exalt you, Lord. I want my life to be a testimony of the power of the living God living in and upon my life, Lord. And I pray for each and every believer here today, Lord. As you search us, Lord, we'd get very specific with you right now, allowing you to work your perfect work in our lives, Lord that they indeed may glorify you, Lord. Let us not put any on any false pretenses. Not, let us not, Lord, pretend to be something, Lord, that we're not. Lord, let us be humble servants of yours that have come in faith to receive of your grace. And I pray that, Lord, for every believer who is here today, Lord. Cause us, God, to allow you to search our hearts, to work in our lives, to cleanse us, God. The blood that flows, God. And Father, for the unbeliever, God, if you've brought any here today who have never made a personal and living commitment to you, Father, I pray they believe that simple message that you love them, that you love them so much and you died for their sins, that they are indeed, if they have not come to you in faith, they are sinners separated from you and that there's no way into heaven other than through faith and believing upon the name of the Son of God that their sin may be taken away by grace through faith in you. Have you come today and have never received Christ, have never made a public acknowledgement that you need a Savior? You can't do it on your own. You can't earn your way into heaven. You can't buy your way. You can't work your way. But Jesus came to pave the way. To make the way. And by believing upon Him, you will be saved. Do you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Do you want to receive the forgiveness of sin? By receiving Christ. If so, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you this morning if you want to receive Christ? If so... Will you show me that by standing right where you're seated right now? Just stand. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, if you want to receive Christ this morning, will you stand right where you're seated this morning? Even as Christ was raised up publicly for you, He wants you to make a public stand for Him even now. Is there anyone here this morning who would say yes? Jesus, I need you. I've been trying to do it on my own. I've been trying to work to be good, that you, would be approved, that, that you would approve of me. He says, believe upon the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, my Son. Is there anyone at all, anyone at all here this morning, anyone who wants to receive Christ and the forgiveness of sin? Well, Father, we thank you for your grace. We know, Lord, that you knock upon the door. And, Lord, it's up to us to respond. And so, Lord, as we hear the message, we trust now, Lord, that your word will go forth. It will not return void, Lord, but will go forth for the intended purpose with, with which it went forth. We thank you, Lord, for just being able to see how you work in the boldness, God, of your servant, John the Baptist, Lord, and the simplicity of the message. The message, Lord, that points to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and who gave yourself for us. We thank you, God, from the bottom of our hearts. 
May we live that life that is pleasing to you at work, at home, in your church. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Mercy.